We just heard this wonderful story, a portion of the nativity, as you know. Mark and Luke, excuse me, Matthew and Luke, have narratives about the birth of Jesus. And I, I want to tell you something you might not have ever noticed about those two texts. There are no Christmas trees at the birth of Jesus. Did you ever notice that? It's kind of fun to look at the things that aren't in the Bible. <laughs> it just can be very revelatory, like, why isn't that there? And if the Christmas trees aren't there, why are they everywhere here, right? So I want to think about that with you because when I was a kid, um, I'll start with this little story. My mom wanted us to get a really nice tree, but this farmer near where we lived in western Kentucky said, oh, you can pick a tree, any tree you want, off of my lot on my farm. So my dad and my brother and I went out and we cut down a tree. Well, the thing was, my dad didn't really want to cut down a Christmas tree. He was kind of like, this is annoying and it's cold. And so he just found the first little tree he could find and cut that tree down and we brought it back. And my mom, who's Canadian and it has certain tree standards, looked at the tree <laughs> and she said, is that the best you could do? Is that the best you could do? Well, our little tree was kind of like a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. And you know, it was the best we did, so we had it there. And the Bible doesn't really have Christmas trees, but the Bible does answer that question, is it the best you could do? The Bible doesn't talk about a Christmas tree, but there are trees throughout the whole thread of salvation history. You know, if you remember at the beginning in the Garden of Eden, there was a tree. There was the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and there was the tree of life. And that tree begins us on a theme of trees that we see from beginning to end in Scripture. The trees bring us a sense of what the overall identity of God is. So we start with these two trees in the Garden of Eden, and then we start to hear things like we heard in the psalm, right? Metaphors for trees. And empires throughout the Old Testament were given allocations of trees. So the cedar and the cypress and the oak all became symbols of empire. There was the oaks of Lebanon, there were the cypress trees of Egypt, and the Roman oak, the oak that represented Rome. These trees were big and giant and everybody could see them. They were the sentinels on the tops of the hills. They were the, the standard bearer for high quality trees and high quality empires. And they were the ways in which we identified through the scriptures what power represented. Well, you know, the geopolitical situation in Palestine, the root of our faith, the location where our faith is born, Bethlehem, where Jesus is born, that was a very difficult place because the empires were on either side and were constantly invading. You might say that Israel was a stump. And in fact, the prophets talk about from the stump of Jesse, a root shall spring forth, a sprout out of the stump of Jesse, you might say Israel was kind of like, Lord, is that the best you could do? Really, this kind of kingdom, right here in the very worst possible spot where we're constantly being invaded by people more powerful than us, is this really where you want to be, oh God? Well, out of that shoot, out of that stump, we got a Charlie Brown Christmas tree. We got Jesus, God incarnate, born not to the empire, not in some fancy place, but in, in a stable and laid in a feed trough. And this Charlie Brown Christmas tree of Jesus, do you know what I mean by Charlie Brown Christmas tree? We've probably all seen that cartoon story over and over and over. And it has that one ornament, and the ornament Charlie Brown puts it on, and the whole tree goes, Bleh, right? Kind of like our baby Jesus. The one ornament on Jesus' tree, 
The one ornament was a love so profound and powerful that it was invasively, infectiously attractive and everyone that encountered it wanted that kind of tree, even though it looked like it was so feeble and powerless and vulnerable. Indeed, the power of that kind of love transformed the world. But it didn't transform everyone because some people hated it. They hated this alternative way of living in the world where nobody is special because everybody is special. That can be annoying if you really think you're more special. And so Jesus, our beloved Savior, God incarnate in human form, died. Died on the wood of a tree. And you know that phrase they say, they thought we were, they thought they could bury us. They did not know we were seeds. Jesus, buried, died, resurrected again on the third day, rose in glory and lives, witnessed by and attested by his disciples and many more. People who believed in that resurrection so much that they were willing to die for it. They saw something that compelling in that resurrection. And so Jesus goes on in our hearts, in our lives, transforming us by the power of that one beautiful ornament of his life and his love. So we have the hardwood of the cross. And then at the end of the Bible, we have another tree. We have the tree of life. And it stands in the middle of two rivers and its leaves give healing for the nations. That, those are our trees in the Bible. Powerful metaphors. Us being represented at times as trees when we put our roots down deep and stretch into the goodness of God, we grow and we flourish. All these metaphors of trees are in the scripture. But you know, the Christmas tree itself, the one that we are used to, it also has a place. It, it grew out of the 15th century, uh, 1400s, is when um, St. Francis of Assisi, in his concern that people be able to understand the gospel story, started doing these plays. And so these plays would begin with Act One, a tree. Well, these were in Germany and Northern Europe, and there weren't a lot of really green trees except for evergreens. And so they would bring the evergreen tree out and it would have the one fruit. And that would be the fruit of the knowledge of tree, of, uh, tree and evil, good and evil. And, and it would be eaten and then it would be pulled back out of the way and the whole rest of the play would be given about the story of salvation. People couldn't read. This was the way of telling that story. Well, guess what? Final act. Here comes the tree. And it's loaded now because it's the tree of life and the book of Revelation. And it's loaded with candy or, you know, goodies, nuts and apples, whatever they have that people can eat, especially the children who are going to go running up after the service and get that food. Isn't that a beautiful metaphor for us to understand why we have those trees? If, if it's on a, in the mall or if it's on our table or it, wherever it is in our house, that it's a symbol of the graciousness of God, of the, the faithfulness of God, and that one sweet, delicious ornament that feeds us throughout the year. There's a wonderful song, and we're going to hear it during communion, Jesus Christ, the apple tree. The sense that Jesus gives the fruit to us, we said it in our psalm, that we eat that fruit, that we receive it in communion, that we receive it in the love of one another, and it gives us strength for our journey. Because Christmas isn't just sweet, it's not just a superficial celebration, it has teeth. It is what gives us the capacity to love in a world that feels so uncertain. The best Jesus could do is enough and way more than enough. This Charlie Brown Jesus has given us 
the gift of joy and hope and love and health, and may we hold on to it. And when we're sitting by our tree, wherever it is, whenever we are, if it's a Christmas tree or if it's an oak or a cypress or wherever, may we lay hold of the fact that indeed the world is full of the love of God and the reminder that God is here for you. Merry Christmas, beloved friends.